Well, it's just as Eric Dollard says it is. Contrary to my uh, desire to um, find a way around Eric Dollard's uh, admonition uh, that you can't produce, uh, you can't synthesize electricity in, in amounts smaller than 500 kVA. Um, despite my attempt to want to get around that, um, it's I, I I wasn't exactly successful. Um, in fact, all I could do was produce four megawatts of power, four negative megawatts, you know, negative as in uh, this thing is turning, is not a motor anymore, it's now a generator. Um, now the whole point to this exercise was to see if I can get it to motorize, uh, to self-turn and produce its own power at the same time. And I always envisioned this possibility when I bought my electric car back in 2013 that the motor could become a generator. Of course, I didn't realize I, w I might have to um, rebuild the motor from scratch or major modifications to an off-the-shelf off AC motor. I don't know. Single-phase AC motor. I don't know how to deal with uh, three-phase uh, AC motors, so I won't even go there. <coughs> Um, but little in my wildest dreams would I consider the possibility that there's no way to produce this uh, free energy in small amounts. And if you consider 4 megawatts, that's a lot of energy. That's comparable to San Onofre nuclear power plant when it used to be in operation. Um, it's also comparable to um, lightning, you know. It's a humongous amount of energy. <laughs> um, but the Edwin Gray team of Richard Hackenberger, physicist, and ele or electrical engineer, I should say, did figure out what to do. Now, initially, they had no clue. Now, let me go through some of these schematics. So this is a, a composition that you can download at is.gd forward slash heaviside ferrante. Ferranti. I misspelled it originally, uh, F-A-R-R, but it's F-E-R-R-A-N-T-I, ferranti. Now, Ferrante, you know, apparently a lot of people were making the mistake, uh, the same mistake. Ferrante wasn't the only one. There was a guy in, um, in America who was making the same mistake, and the Royal Society of London. So three different groups of individuals making the same mistake, thinking, oh, this transatlantic uh, cable problem we're having. You know, they didn't have any repeaters, any boosting stations uh, in the Atlantic to boost the signal. Uh, like they did on land when they had the telegraph operation in the 1850s. You know, they had earth batteries every 150 miles or so to boost the signal. They didn't know what they were doing. They just thought, oh, it works, so let's do it, you know. <laughs> and they found if they extended uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, distance between the boosting stations, they actually started to get a little over unity. Um, but in the Atlantic Ocean, they didn't have that advantage, you know, what is it, a thousand miles or more or something, you know, and and the only thing that got across was the electrostatic component, the electric field. You know, Eric Dollar has said, you know, no, nothing transmits through the wire anyway. It, it happens in the wire as a, um, what did he call it, a blending or a place of junction, a meeting ground between the two fields that surround the wire. But it's the electric field and the magnetic field that propagates down the outside of the wire or the space surrounding and inside the wire. You know, it's the space. It's the wire is just in, in space, in empty space, there's no waveguide, no wire act to act as a waveguide to serve as the junction point between the two fields. And so we don't see electricity in space. We just see a lot of uh, dissipation of magnetism very quickly because magnetism, I electromagnetism, electromagnetic waves do not travel through space. They, they, um, they d get dampened down by space very quickly because they're a short range influence. It's only the electrostatic that traverses an infinite distance because it doesn't travel. It merely, it induces it you know, the, the, the effect of a voltage change in one area of the universe affects all areas of the universe simultaneously because 
it does not travel. It doesn't have to travel. But electrostatics can't. That's why it's called static for a reason. It don't it ain't traveling. <laughs> it ain't moving. Yet its influence is immediate. It's instantaneous because it doesn't have to move to create a reaction, a voltage reaction, everywhere else in the universe. So everything in the universe is, is instantaneously connected via the dielectric medium of, entry, of empty space, the vacuum of empty space. So it's a figure of speech to say energy from the vacuum because you're not getting energy from the vacuum. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. <laughs> you're getting it from time. But that's not the purpose of this video. <laughs> Anywho, so here is the composition, and uh, we have an insert of the schematic. We have an insert of the input to compare with the output of wattage. Then we have the output in terms of volts RMS, 3.4 kilovolts, and 1.95 kiloamps RMS. And then we have... Um, Oh, that comes from this diagram here, uh, the separation between the RMS amps and the RMS volts. Uh, but that's the insert, and here's the link. So now let's look at another schematic, if we can find it. There we go. So this is the full schematic. And so what I did was, I took my old model, which is totally voltage-oriented, and I inserted a transformer in here, and I connected it via another little rotor coil that to make the first rotor coil by filer. So now they're wound, they're entwined together in the rotor. And how are we going to fit a transformer inside the rotor that has uh, 10 Henrys on one side, on the secondary side of all places, and 200 nano Henrys on the primary side, so it's a step-up transformer? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but in any case, I measured the um, energy of the first rotor, the primary rotor, and the secondary rotor together to give us this combined effect. And then, to contrast the, the output, I measured uh, the input at the sine wave generator. Now, normally, without this transformer inserted in the circuit, the current input is noise. It's random activity, and only the voltage input is a nice clean-cut 3-volt sine wave at whatever frequency. Th in this case, I was able to lower the frequency to 20 hertz. Um, normally, I don't get to do that. I, uh, maybe I might go as low as 30 plus a little, a little. But normally, I like to hang around between 50 and 70. And the simulator, unfortunately, has a limitation. It cannot go above 1.35 megahertz. So it's not to say you cannot go any higher. I think it's really a problem of the simulator. The simul simulators all have their limitations, and you have to work within those limitations. Uh, and, <laughs> and computers <laughs> have their limitations. So between the limitations of the computer and the simulator, I have my limitations on what I can do. And because I bought this, well, I didn't pay for this simulator, microcap simulator from SpectrumSoft, um, I am using their free demo version from 20, uh, is it 2017, version 11? Um, I don't get to do much. I have to keep everything simple. And so you don't see me putting in starter coils here. And I renamed what used to be the starter coils my current coils, because that's what they are. They have zero voltage and uh, nothing but high current. And then the voltage coils have lots of voltage and only a minuscule amount of current. So I name them VC for voltage currents, uh, voltage coils, I should say. Um, but this is the electrostatic area of the circuit, all of this. And then this is the electromagnetic portion. Okay, so it's two different portions lumped with all these different lumping relationships. Um, except for here is the only area that is not lumped. It's an actual true transformer representing the motor armature of the single phase induction motor. Because this is all AC. But the starter coils have to be um, um, well they have to be DC because everything here is negative power factor in which the current and the voltage are out of phase by a whole half cycle 180 degrees. And I doubt this thing will rotate 
without the help of either starter coils converted uh, into DC or a little electric motor. See, I forgot about that. I better add that in my chapter on rotation challenges. A little electric starter motor to get this thing, this thing started, and then the electric mo uh, starter motor can disengage uh, once this thing starts to turn. Now, when you want to go in reverse, <laughs> then you have to put it in, you know, you have to come to a stop, hopefully, and then the little starter motor has to start again, but in reverse direction to get you to go in reverse. Uh, but this thing won't start to turn. There's no way it's going to happen. Now, there is a chapter, I think, in my book somewhere in which I talk about reverse wi winding because you have to accommodate the fact that the current and the voltage are out of phase. And that'll work for these coils to do reverse winding. But what about these coils? You can't. If, if reverse winding is not going to help. Um... Well, let's see. No, maybe it will. Oh, maybe it will. <coughs> I didn't do that in my simulation. I'm going to have to do that. I didn't notice any difference in power gain, so I didn't bother to do it, but I forgot. You're supposed to do that. Uh, because one side, the top side here, is 200 nanohenries, and the bottom side here is uh, uh, 10 henries. That means all your current is going to be focused, congregating over here in the 200 nanohenry coil. The <laughs> what's considered the uh, what I'm considering the primary coil, and then the secondary, the 10 Henry coil, is going to be where all your voltage is going to hang out at. So if you cross wind them, you'll be able to put the negative power factor back in alignment with itself, so that its positive power factor. I'm assuming, I'm speculating here. Um, there's no way for the simulator to tell me this. Well, it should. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Now, that <coughs> according to Microcap help file, the way you do it, they don't allow you to swap the uh, terminals like uh, Paul Falstead does in his. Here, they say you have to make the coupling coefficient negative. So let's make it negative. And now let's simulate. Uh, so what will we be looking for? Let's see. We'll be looking for at least this coil. It should show up on uh, the other rotor coil. Um, the voltage versus the amps. So we won't do RMS. We'll <laughs> of course, that'll obliterate uh, the waveforms. Oh, shoot. I, did, I didn't shrink down the... Uh, whoops. <laughs> Sorry. 80. That's a little high. Huh. Sorry. All right, let's start that again. Let's get rid of that. Okay. Oh, shoot. Now it's not going to work. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, a little, a little technical glitch here. Um, <laughs> um, uh, now it'll work. There we go. Uh, let's see. So why don't I give you the rest of the lecture while we wait for this to simulate. So Richard Hackenberger had a problem. The EV gray motor could not produce small quantities of energy because it was correctly designed for speed to, pr to provide speed in an electric vehicle, unlike the Joseph Newman motor, which cannot because there is no iron armature. All I can do is give you torque at a very slow speed. Uh, not unlike the DC motors taken out of forklifts in the early days of electric vehicle conversion kits and, you know, tinkerers in their garage. Oh, that was quick. Um, let's see. So now we got to get the voltage. Ah, see, look at all those nice 1.6 kilovolt spikes. 1.5, 1, 1 kilovolt spikes. Very fast frequency, so that'll have a good gripping action uh, between the rotor and the stator. Uh, let's see. Oh, and by the way, that's what I'm uh, 
see I'm assuming here that one of these coils on the transformer is the rotor I guess the 200 nano Henry and then the stator would be the 10 Henry um, but the input side the primary side is the 200 nano Henry in terms of the wiring so let's get the uh, amperage for this let's see I rotor 2 normally you would combine them but I just want to look at the waveforms. Oh, they're huge. I should have done that first. Uh, yeah. Well, let's see. We can increase the size of this. We'll have to. <laughs> oh, shit. Sorry. Let's start again. <laughs> Excuse my French. Or my German, if you prefer. Why is it taking so long? Oh, shit. I got to go all over again. Okay, so the Richard Hackenberger had a team had a problem. What to do with all the excess energy? And in the beginning, all it, all they could think of was doing was to throw all that excess energy into a bunch of batteries. So they had two batteries at, to power the motor, and then they had two batteries to dump the excess energy in. And they were blowing up the lead acid batteries. They didn't know what to do. And then the FCC came in and raided them because they didn't have an AM radio uh, on nearby to let them know of all the electrostatics and electromagnetic inf uh, uh, noise that they were broadcasting in their local neighborhood. So they were raided. <laughs> um, so let me finish my thought before I... So um, what Rich he, Richard Hackenberger did was, was he came up with a solution. He, what he did was he got rid of the batteries. Obviously, they weren't <laughs> doing the job. And... Um, he forced compressed air through the interior of the motor to blow out the ionized, well, first of all, to prevent arcing and to blow out the ionized air so that the ionized, the fresh air coming in could get charged up and carry the electrostatic charge of the motor away from the motor. And then the ionized air could ground itself to nearby objects and everything, everybody would be happy. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> it would not be positive ions because that creates smog. Hopefully, it would be negative ions and help create rain and clear out the smog. But be that as it may, it could be a mix of both. It could be a random mix of negative and positive ions. We don't know because Richard Hackenberger didn't do an EPA. See, now, if he wanted to comply with the EPA, he would have had to uh, figure that out and get it to be either balanced or negative, because if he was producing positive ions, that would be unhealthy <laughs> for plants and animals and the humans. Anywho, be that as it may, they weren't thinking ahead. They were just trying to get the thing to run and get investors and get money. That's all Edwin Gray wanted was money to flow in. <laughs> they had a ho problems at times towards the end with money. And Richard Hackenberger dying of a heart attack because uh, <laughs> it was very hard to live with Edwin Gray. <laughs> Anywho, be that as it may. Um, or work with him. Um, so then what he had to do, though, is he had to build up the electrostatic field surrounding the motor. He had to convert all that excess energy that the motor was not using into electrostatics. And to do that, he had to make a few modifications to the prior develop developmental stages of the Edwin Gray motor. What he had to do was, besides blowing compressed air through the motor, that was the first step, the second thing he had to do and you'll see this in the patent, if you look up the patent of the Edwin Gray motor, he had brackets, aluminum brackets, supporting the coils, because this, this was a pulsed DC motor, and the coils were, you know, it's not like an AC where you've got, well, whatever. <laughs> uh, AC is a little different. So a DC pulse motor, he had aluminum brackets, and they were insulated from the interior other parts of the motor. So the aluminum brackets uh, supporting the coils inside the motor, they were electrically isolated so that they could build up an electrostatic charge. Now the coils themselves will also have, uh, an or I should say the coils, but most particularly their insulation of the wire, will also build up an electrostatic charge. And this is important. I never noticed that, I realized this till the, just this morning when I gave it some thought. Now on the outside of the motor, he put nine bands of copper, sheet metal, around the circumference of the motor. So, you know, most motors are barrel-shaped. 
or drum-shaped. And so around the circumference of the barrel, uh, he put nine bands of copper sheeting spaced. And he changed, he went, originally they had an aluminum chassis to the motor, and then they changed to some other material, uh, plastic or something, I don't know. Uh, but then he changed back to aluminum, and then had Teflon coating put on the inside of the aluminum chassis. So he's got the, uh, the aluminum brackets on the inside, then he's got the copper and, you know, ma magnetic insulated copper wire surrounding those aluminum brackets. Then he's got the blowing compressed air acting as another stage of dielectric besides the insulation on the, mag on the magnetic wiring of the coils. Now extended from that, he's got the compressed air. And then on the other side, he's got the Teflon coating. Uh, so three layers of dielectric, you know, two of them stationary, more or less, I mean, uh, except for whatever... See, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not clear what rotated on the inside. Well, he had a stat set of stator coils and a set of, set of rotor coils. So the stator coils were stationary, but the rotor coils moved. So he had some dielectrical material stationary and some moving. And then he had the aluminum chassis on the opposite side, on the outside, surrounded by nine copper bands. And, of course, that was stationary. So he was able to set up an electrostatic field, convert any of the magnetism that was... <laughs> that attracted the FCC in the first place, because just about all, well, all radio broadcast is electromagnetic. Uh, and he, they were putting out a, a very large electromagnetic field. So he converted that electromagnetism into electrostatics, in addition to whatever electrostatics he was already producing, and then blew it out by ionizing the air on the interior of the device so that he could then... Um, eliminate or get rid of the electrostatic field also that was building up around his motor. But that was the last stage, or the penultimate stage, before he blew it out, which was the last stage. Okay. Um, so those are two alternatives <coughs> to getting rid of an electromagnetic and electrostatic field is to convert it into electrostatics, you know, reduce the electromagnetic, boost the electrostatic, and then blow it out with, with uh, air, lots of air, uh, that you ionize. You, so you create your own little ionization generator of sorts. <sighs> now we covered that. That was Mark McKay's analysis uh, to the solution to the FCC problem. <laughs> um, so we might have to do something similar here because we're creating a humongous amount of energy um, that has no business whoops, wrong way you know, a, a humongous amount of volts and amps a humongous amount of watts that has no business being in this motor because it's too much there's no way we're going to be able to run a little electric car <laughs> off of four megawatts. This, it's just not going to happen. So we've got to get rid of all this energy, and I suspect we're going to have to do something similar. We're going to have to do what Richard Hackenberger did to get rid of the excess energy um, because the coils on this thing are just not going to handle that. It's, it's going to fry itself, and that's... And when you look at negative power, people who ask questions on, like, say, Quora or elsewhere about negative power factor, that's one of the, and various forums uh, devoted to the topic, that's one of the prime concerns, is that you're going to get energy that's going to fry your device. Too much and excess of energy that's going to fry your device because it wasn't rated for over unity. <laughs> it was rated for under unity. Um, so now let's c see if we can produce okay we want current only and we want rotor number two see if you do the current the, the larger of the two first so now the current is in blue and normally I like to put the current in red and the voltage in blue but we got to do it in reverse because the current is larger than the voltage so now we can go back to the image or the schematic 
and just click on rotor number two to get the voltage in red. See how tiny it is? Now, let's look for the high, the peak. So the highest point of amperage, of current, is six kiloamps. Okay, so that's the peak current, not the RMS. And when we switch to voltage, the peak of voltage is 1.5 volts. So uh, let's go back. That's 1.5. And what was the current? It was 6. So let's get our little handy dandy calculator. Whoopsie. I don't want scientific, I want standard. So we take 6 and divide by 1.5. I, I tried to get one-to-one -one relationship as best I could, but I had a hard time doing it. Um, the simulator was crapping out on me. It was giving me error messages on the one hand, transient time step too small, transient analysis time step, or it s said the opposite problem. Uh, see, that's a convergent problem, but the opposite problem is it went to over unity and just blew itself up. Matrix is singular. That means the thing blew itself up with an excess of energy because the spark gap was failing to fire. Um, so I had a hard time making sure the spark gap fired on the one hand and the simulator didn't crap out on me on the other hand. So the ratio here is 4 to 1. So ideally, in an electric car, what I see happening, at least in a DC car, no, in an AC too. Um, well, not Tesla Motors. That's a whole different ball game. But in the more the the the, the less the lesser priced uh, sandwich spreads of electric cars, it's usually 1.67 to one of voltage to amps. That's the ratio. 1.67 to one. Um, here I've got four to one, and actually, in the Tesla Motors car, you have a preponderance of amperage, as I recall. Uh, I think it was over a kiloamps, over one kiloamps, uh, by some amount, and then the voltage was somewhere around three, four, uh, three hundred, three or four hundred uh, volts. So that's a different ratio, but it's not four to one, and it's not volts to amps. It's amps to volts. Well, actually, this is amps to volts. So this is ideal. This is more closer to the Tesla Motors ideal than to the lower priced spreads. So that means you get a lot of acceleration in this motor, which is what the Tesla Motors car was made designed to be. It was designed off of uh, Tony Caccioni, I b uh, what was his name? Anthony Caccioni. He designed the motor controller for the EV1, the General Motors EV1 from 1997 to 2003. And he, if you go see the movie, Who Killed the Electric Car? He's in there. I forget his name exactly. Uh, and they interview him. Um, so he was a race car enthusiast, but he was an electric car enthusiast. So all his race cars that he designed and raced were electric cars. And he started a company called AC Propulsions. And uh, I can't remember if it's singular or plural propulsion. Um, they're in... Uh, I don't know, Irvine or San Dimas, somewhere in Southern California. And so when the EV1, when General Motors <laughs> crushed all the EV1s, and th thus the movie Who Killed the Electric Car came into being, um, and a lot of unhappy people, because <laughs> they never sold the car, they only leased it. Um, he went and took his technology and donated it to Elon Musk. And Elon Musk made uh, Alan, that's his name, Alan Cochoni, made him a silent partner. So you won't see him, you won't hear about him, but he's actually a silent partner because he's the whole reason why the Tesla Motors car has such good acceleration. Because he just took the motor controller out of the EV1 and put it in the Tesla Motors and racked up the price. Uh, well, General Motors never gave us a price figure for the sale of the car, so we don't know what they would sell it at. But it really was designed like a race car. Just as Tom Hanks says on that little video clip of him being interviewed by David Letterman on the David Letterman uh, late night show, late, late night show with David Letterman, um, 
Tom Hanks said, you get in that thing and it just zips down the highway and you you can be afraid of getting a speeding ticket because the thing has such great acceleration. Well, yeah, because the amps dominate over the voltage. So that's where you get your speed. Whereas in Joseph Newman, you get all torque and no speed to speak of. You know, he hand starts it with his muscle bound hands. No little old lady could do it. Um, and then it does pick up a little bit of speed after the course of warming up. Uh, I don't know how long it takes to warm up, 15 minutes, half an hour, hour. I, he never said in the Newman mo uh, movie, the documentary, and so I don't know how long it takes, but he does indicate that it takes some time to warm up to speed. Uh, but it still cranks along at a relatively slow speed by comparison to electric cars, especially uh, electric race cars. So that was my first order of business, was to try to fix that solution. And that's what I did yesterday. I created all these amps versus the volts, 4 to 1 amps over volts. But it's still negative power factor. So uh, what we want to do now, I, c I changed, you saw me, I changed, I put in a negative coupling coefficient in the transformer. So now we want to see if I succeeded in uniting the amps with the volts. I doubt it. <laughs> I, I'm sure it'll still tell me that it's, um, anyway, let's try and see what happens. Cause so I'm s because, you know, whether or not we have to put in starter coils that have, uh, have been rectified. And I have, t I had, I've already covered that. I've done that in another circuit simulation and I have to do it separately because of my limitation in not having paid the $4,500 to fully register my product. Um, I don't get to make very complicated circuits, so I don't get to see the full implication of what I'm doing. Um, so let's remove this upper bound and change it. Uh, oh, my glasses are not functioning properly. Okay. So now we want to zoom in in terms of time. So we get 7. If I can find the number 7, 8, 7. And then the 9. I think three nines might do it. There we go. So now you see, uh, we did not lose. <laughs> They're still out of phase by 180 degrees. Let's uh, let's go one down. See. So the the red being the voltage and the blue being the um, excuse me, the red being the voltage right and the blue being the amperage. They're totally 180 degrees out of phase, because if we select one of these... No, that won't do. Uh, <laughs> Alright, if we select one, we say that the peak of the amperage is totally lined up with the trough of the voltage. So they're totally still 180 degrees out of phase. So I didn't succeed. Um, I didn't think it would. I didn't see any uh, change in output when I change the coupling coefficient so I didn't think it was uh, worth my time but we still got to try you know to um, coil these in counter winding condition I know we'll have to here possibly the current coils versus the voltage coils will have to be counter wound with reference to each other um, but whether or not doing so over here will do any good I don't know um, it probably won't do any good on the r two rotor coils, and they should be entwined together anyway, so they should probably uh, not be messed with. So they're the only coils not to counterwind, I would imagine. Uh, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, though. See, I don't know. I can't simulate this, so I don't know. So let me see if I've covered everything. Um, I guess that's it. So that's my update this morning. So you see the necessity of um, putting in an armature in, in this model. See, I didn't know that these coils did not have an iron core. I just, I, I, I was, I was dumb. <laughs> these are air core coils. Um, and so they build up a lot of voltage and torque. They, they build up a lot of electromotive force, a lot of torque. But there's no magnetomotive force to give us speed. Um, to speak of. So I had to boost the magnetomotive component of the fields within this thing, contributing to the magnetism and electrostatics. So those are four different things, electrostatics and um, 
magnetism versus the magnetomotive force and the electromotive force. Those are four different entities, and <laughs> it's good to get it straight. They're not, not to confuse them. They're not the same thing. Even though they're similar, similarly related, similar, similarly related, they are not the same thing. Um, the magnetomotive force and the electromotive force are the proto components, the proto ingredients, uh, or, the, or they are the ingredients, or the components of proto electricity. You know, they go to form electricity, but they are not electricity that eat themselves. And then what we see when we measure electricity, the volts and the amps, or m spe specifying the current level, that's merely the effect of their union because we never see volts separate from amps, right? Ohm's law puts them together as a multiplicative relationship. We cannot separate them when we're dealing with electricity. But when we're dealing with the ingredients of electricity, now we're dealing with, we're not dealing with Ohm's law anymore, and we're just dealing with two, two forces that are separate from each other and have not yet been united in a circuit. They're just floating around in the universe, you know? The magnetomotive force hanging out around matter in p close proximity to matter. So we get light in the atmosphere. We see the stars from the vantage point of Earth, but we cannot see stars from space because there's not enough matter in space to allow electromagnetic radiation of light to travel any great distance. It, it stops after a very short distance. And so... Um, all we can sense in the universe is electrostatics. And any kind of telescope, well, radio, s supposedly radio telescope, uh, positioned in space would have to be an electrostatic radio telescope, not an electromagnetic variety. It could do the conversion. It can have an electromagnetic conver uh, conversion inside itself to convert from electrostatics to electromagnetics in order to get the kind of uh, images of light that we might want to see a star. But, you know, that's a conversion it has to do. Well, the atmosphere already does the conversion for us and then diffuses it, diffracts it, or both, <laughs> diffracts it, but only after it's already done the, conf the conversion. So the aurora borealis, I would suspect, is the conversion process so intense that it lights up the sky in the north, and we call it northern lights. That's the actual conversion taking place between the electrostatic impinging, or exciting, I should say, the upper atmosphere of the North Pole area, and causing it to excite the atoms of air to produce all kinds of electromagnetic radiation that can that then gets transferred to surrounding air molecules and meets up with our eyes. So we're actually getting a mild current directly impinging our eyeball as a light wave. So that's what photons are. They're very, very weak currents that can only travel through matter at short range distances. We're actually getting a slight current uh, uh, of excitement to our eyeball, to the retina of our eyeball or else we wouldn't see this, this star because of if it were not for the atmosphere giving us that current. Without current, we don't see light. It's not going to happen. Um, in space capsules and the helmet visors of space uh, uh, suits, they have Fresnel lenses specially designed to excite the glass uh, to I to to uh, act as a um, what do you call it as the right medium of excitement to the air inside the helmet to cause light to appear inside the helmet as a byproduct of the diff Fresnel lens on the visor. So the visor is a dielectric material, just like the vacuum of space is a dielectric, but the di but the dielectric of space does not have a Fre Fresnel lens embedded in it. That we have to provide on the space helmet visor, the glass visor. And then we have to put a layer of gold in there to prevent the poor astronaut from going blind if he should perhaps see the sun, um, even if for only for an instant, he'll go blind, <laughs> I think permanently. Um, so they have to put a layer of gold in there, very thin, 
it's so thin you can't see it. Uh, the RAV4 EV from between the years of, uh, I forget what year models, I know my model, the 2002, that's not operable at the moment, has a layer of, uh, I guess it's iron or some aluminum. I think it's aluminum. They put a very thin layer sandwiched in there, and they, s they still continue to put it on the cockpits of jet airliners and jet planes. Um, but it was too expensive, and it, it creates hazards. It makes it easy for the windshield to crack. So it was an experiment that Toyota did for the RAV4 EV conversion from the RAV4 gasoline engine into an EV model that I am now the third proud owner of, even though I can't drive it because all the batteries, well, most of the batteries are dead. And that's why I embarked upon this self-study course <laughs> involving over three years of study at the benefit of simulators, various simulators and various people like Eric Dollard helping me to understand what I was doing. And so I've gotten all of this expertise that's in my subconscious because I never took notes except for videos. And um, it's really a skill that I developed to be able to uh, encourage a surge, nurture it into existence, and then try to manage it and hopefully get out of it something harnessable, something usable uh, to put to good use. And negative power factor with a 90, uh, excuse me, with a 180 degree separation between current and voltage is not exactly useful for a standard conventional motor. So it's going to, it's a technical difficulty or a technical challenge how to put it to good use, but it definitely is free energy and now it's balanced. I've got a, magne uh, a magnetic component with lots of magneto magnetomotive force surrounding a, an armature, and then I have the electromotive force associated with uh, air core coils. And between the two, we may get both speed and torque for this thing to operate as a nice, hefty performance comparable to a Tesla Motors car. Yet the um, the coefficient of performance between the output and the input, if I can find it here, here it is. This input is five and a half nanowatts compared to the output is four megawatts. So when you take four megawatts and divide by five and a half nanowatts, you get 7.27e to the 14 to 1 coefficients of performance. Do you know what that is? 7.27e to the plus 14? That's 727 trillion to 1. Is that trillion? Right. Well, it's 14. Well, let's see. Well, 12 is four groups of three zeros. So 100 million thousand. No, 100,000 million billion, and then the fifth group is uh, trillion. That's right. 727 trillion to one coefficients of performance. So yeah, that's pretty good. Obviously, you would need a tiny little battery to power um, this sine wave generator. Actually, you would need a 12-volt battery. Yeah, you would need a 12-volt a battery to power the sine wave generator, so you already have that under the hood. So you don't need a battery pack. And then you would use a uh, group of solar panels on the roof of the car to produce the quantity of uh, amperage to recharge the battery because you're not spending a whole lot. You're spending less powering this car than you are probably powering your, the audio system <laughs> in your car because the audio system is usually not designed to be over unity unless it was a John Bedini audio system. We're going to have to replace the audio system with a John Bedini audio system. Uh, to get be more economical, but anyway, be that as it may, because it had had over unity elements in its circuitry. John Bedini admitted to, but he never told anybody. He didn't want to <laughs> scare away the consumer. He wanted to make money. <laughs> his, he wanted his brother Gary Bedini to make the money so he could spend it on his projects, um, such as the audio system that he developed. But it, it, to me, to my mind, it looks like uh, the the power component uh, of the car that's running the car is going to be spending less than the audio system. Let me tell you, <laughs> it spends so little. Um, I think that's everything. Oh, there was one little interesting thing. When I looked at the waves up close and did a measurement, 
Um, let's see, where were they? They were at the warm-up stage. So you saw what I did when I zoomed in. I, I should change this. Yeah, this is not correct, this statement here. Um, this is only correct in the beginning when it def the, the mo uh, the de this device first begins to start up. Um, the frequency of the input current and the input voltage are different. The input voltage is set to 20 kilohertz, but the input current ends up being 95 kilohertz for some strange reason. But that's, I think, only in the beginning. No, that's not true. That's in the end. Oh, so this statement is correct. So, yeah, no, I zoomed, I showed you, I zoomed into this. That's right. Oh, this is, it, this, this is the strangest thing. So let's, let's bring up, oh, I have to do, wait again. <laughs> yeah, the input current and voltage waves are not even the same wavelength. That's what's so bizarre. Uh, the current vibrates faster than the voltage for some strange reason. And that shows you that there's really no drainage. The current is free to vibrate at a faster rate, and it does so. And the fact that it vibrates at a faster rate shows that this thing is going to be stepping up its power because normally when you see an increase of frequency, you're going to see an increase of overall power because frequency is the predecessor. It's, the, it's a potential form of energy. It's not kinetic, but it is potential energy, and it shows you that, oh, your kinetic energy is going to uh, increase. So let's take a look at the voltage wave. And then let's add the current. Uh, let's see, I gotta get the current statement. Um, input, output. So let's get, let's see, voltage. Let's hope I get all the components here. Yep, that's it. Okay, now there's the current. You see how teeny it is <laughs> comparison to 3 volts? It's, uh, it's teeny. Um, so now let's change the timing. Uh, first of all, let's make this 3. And then let's change the timing to point oh seven three nines that should do it <coughs> nope okay two nines okay so you see the wave okay the the, the blue is the the voltage so it's dominating the current we don't get to see yet because we have to zoom in. So when we zoom in, we're going to lose. So remember now which way the wave is in this window of view. We've got the peaks over to the left side of the graph and the troughs over to the right. It's going to flip when we look at the red uh, current. But we got to zoom in and remember be the voltage because we're not going to see the voltage anymore. So let's see. How do I do this? Um, got to change the whole number. Uh, let's see, point, no, it'd be, uh, no, it would be point, point, well, let's see, zero, <laughs> start with zero, point, zero, zero, one, and then let's do zero, point, zero, zero, uh, one. See if that does the job. No, it does not. So let's add in two more zeros. That might do it. Nope. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's increase this to seven. And seven. There, we're starting to get... Okay. So let's see, let's go to eight. Uh, now, how do we tell if this is shifted? Oh, <coughs> well, the fact is, 
the wave, the peaks are shifted to the right and the troughs are shifted to the left. So we don't get, I'm sorry, we don't get two waves to compare with. We get a multiple of waves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We get, <coughs> we get about four and a half times more because, uh, right, uh, what did I say? 95 hertz versus 20. Uh, that would be a difference of about four and a half. 95 divided by 20. Uh, 4.75. So just under 5 to 1. Uh, yeah, that's about right, because I counted 10 and the other was 2. But um, the peaks are shifted to the right, whereas before the voltage, the peaks were shifted to the left and the troughs were shifted to the right. So it shows that it's still uh, 180 degrees out of phase, but it also shows that it's a much faster frequency than before. So it's kind of interesting. You know, these are all interesting things you can do in microcap is zoom in and whatnot. I don't make use of all the features because I don't even know what they are, and I don't try to find out what they are. Um, now notice that the capacitor here, the stabilizing influence on the spark gap, is 1e to the minus 9. That would be, I think, 1 nano farad if I'm not mistaken. But these other capacitors, the three of them, and they all end in, uh, influence of stabilization, they're 1e to the negative 11, which means I think that would be 10 pico farads, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so they're a little tinier. Um, now, I called this the throttle. Oh, that was the other. See, I knew there was something else that I had a thought this morning. Um, and I think actually what we have to do uh, what was I I was gonna put another resistor someplace else so this helps throttle the electrostatics but we still have to throttle the speed the electromagnetics so we have to put a resistor somewhere and I thought may we can't take this out because it would destabilize it um, we could put it uh, resistor there in its place but I think instead Maybe if we put a resistor in line, I wonder if it would louse up the simulation. Let's try that. Let's put a resistor here on the positive side and see what happens. I didn't try this yet, sorry. I <laughs> should have tried it before the video. Uh, there's no room. Uh, let's make it one ohm. And then let's move this out, move this in, move this up, whoopsies, ah, there, so let's simulate that, oh, let's go back and change this, because that didn't do anything to take out the negative. All right, now let's simulate this and see what happens. If it craps out on us or... Because <coughs> I had a hard time bringing down that 4 to 1 relationship. And I, and I thought to myself, well, how are you going to change the speed on this? You've got to have some way to regulate this. Um, now, previously, I had considered the possibility that you multi-strand this and then you use little transistors switches to disconnect some of the parallel strands. Um, but I never found good over unity from uh, increasing this bifiler beyond trifiler. It was better on, the, on these current coils to make them uh, multi-filer. And I went as high as eight, I think, was the ma um, maximum efficiency. If you add more, you don't gain a whole lot, but you would be able to regulate the current of these current coils because this is a there's no resistance here the current just likes to flow around in this outer circle um, all the resistance is in the middle here building up voltage and then because this is a step down transformation because it has a bifiler coupling of 99 percent um, so you get a mass of current massing up here in this outer perimeter and then all the voltage is amassing here in the middle um, and then it blends when it transfers over to this rotor here. And then also then, because of 99% coupling, 
armature coupling, it transfers over to this rotor here. Um, so let's see what is uh, going on with, uh, let's see, what w we want to take a look at. Um, well we can't go there. Well, let's just take a look at the voltage, see if it went up. Oh, no, it's the same. Huh. All right, let's take a look at the... Uh, Uh, let's see. <sighs> the current for rotor two. Oh, it's the same. Nothing happened. It didn't bring it down. It didn't get in the way. I'm still getting over unity. Great. So it didn't change anything. So now let's increase the size of this resistor. Bring it out here. Let's just add in a kilo ohm of resistance to see what happens. And let's simulate that. See if it kills the overunity or does it do its it, my intention is to merely modify the overunity. Now we saw that the amps was greater than the volts, so now the volts should be greater than the amps on this rotor. So we should be able to increase. Oh, maybe I should put the resistor on this side. Oh, I may be putting it on the wrong side. That might be why nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If I put it on the current side. Duh. <laughs> Oops. Um. <laughs> okay. Some, uh, I, I always, uh, hey, I'm a newbie, you know. I always seem to do this. Whenever I do something new, I always do the opposite of what I should be doing. <laughs> All right, so what do we got? We got the same voltage. Yeah, nothing happens. I bet you that it's the same current, too. Yep. <laughs> Humongous current. Okay. So let's move this. First, we got to turn it around. And let's... Oh, wait a minute. Mm, let's take this wire out and put it over here. And then let's move this up. Move this into position. Move this back down. Whoops. And then lengthen this wire. Okay. Let's try that again. That should have an effect on uh, changing the uh, current to this thing. <laughs> Isn't this fun? I love to simulate. You get to play around with these ideas and see what'll happen so that when the tech when the real engineers go to design the thing, they know what to expect. Cause the idea man <laughs> me went to the trouble of fooling around, having some fun for free at no one's expense but mine. Okay, so now the voltage sh should dominate. So let's see the voltage. <gasps> it killed it. Probably changed the frequency. A little too severe. Okay, let's just do a mild resistance. Uh, let's do uh, the number three. Three ohms. Yeah, that should be a reasonable, maybe. Well, we don't know that. <laughs> What's reasonable? <coughs> that was a little too severe. Um, okay. Oh, it's very severe. Wow, that's what I was afraid of. Okay, so let's change this to 1.1. 1. 1.1 1. 1 ohms. Because we're changing the frequency, not just the balance of volts to amps. Um, that kind of sounds about right, that you're going to affect the frequency. Oh my god, is it severe. <laughs> uh, I want to see a little change. I, I want to be able to compare them. Okay. 1.01 oh one ohms. Let's see what that does. So we're talking teensy-weensy throttling here. Ah, this is a little better. Yeah. All right. Ugh. Wow. 
Well, you know, you have two uh, resistors that are in parallel. Your main resistor is one ohm, and then your tiny little resistors. Well, actually, no, you would have, oh, that's right. You would just have a lot of resi one ohm resistors in parallel. If you can't get a high voltage or a high current uh, resistor to be less than one ohm, then you just add a lot of them in parallel to divide up the current, such as I'm doing here. <laughs> um, 1.001, so that's 1 ohm plus 1 milliohm. So I added a milliohm to the 1 ohm because I'm having a hard time making a tiny change in the current. Well, because 2 microohm coil I have set to uh, 6 microohms of resistance, so you see, anything greater than 6 microohms is going to make a, a, a drastic change. Oh my god. <laughs> what did I say? Anything over 6 microohms? <laughs> yep. Yep. So now this is 100, no. 10, wait a minute, 100? No, wait. Point 0.1 would be 100 milliohms, 10 milliohms, 1 milliohms. So this should be 100 microohms. So we added 100 microohms of resistance to the 1 ohm. It might still be too much. Yep, it's too much. Yep, this, oh my god. So now I got 10 micro ohms added. Maybe we have to add just one micro ohm. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? How, oops, see, I was right. Oh, I'm not getting any benefit. Oh my god. Well, I had no problem with one ohm. Didn't I? Oh, I never did try one ohm, did I? Well, all right, so let's try 100 milliohms. Whoopsies. This is okay. This is not like Paul Falstead's simulator where capital M means mega. Here you have to write out MEG for mega, but just for clarity's sake, let's make that lowercase m for 100 milliohms. So actually, you have to add in teensy weensy, because I had it on the wrong side, the other... I had it on the voltage side, and nothing was happening. <laughs> so now everything is happening. Oh my god, it's so delicate. Oh, there's more like it. It's taking longer now. Now we're going to get our waves. So it should work. It should. So this is the, the throttle, the actual throttle. So this is the power throttle. I should call this power throttle. I'm going to rename this power throttle. Uh, no, the torque throttle. Um... No, this is the boost. I should just say R1 because it's not the throttle. And then I'll rename this resistor the throttle, the actual throttle, because that's the way I think that's the way it should be. Ah, see? So it took longer. You remember before it, it warmed up and started uh, the staccato wedge surges at a much earlier point in time, somewhere around over here. So now it took longer to warm up, and the peaks are below 200 volts instead of the 1.6 was the limit before so we've reduced the voltage but now let's see what we've done to the current if I'm gonna have to go back the other way oh so it's still the amps are still greater than the volts but the overall wattage has been diminished and I think that's what they do in an AC motor they call it f they call it field excitation. They vary the field excitation of the coils, which means, you, you know, in a DC motor, you change, you vary the current, and you keep the voltage constant. But in an AC motor, it's a little different. So I guess maybe that's what I've managed to do here. I've managed to reduce the excitation level overall of the coil, because the, the amps still dominate. But they don't dominate as much, though. They have come down. That's right, they have come down. So let's see, if we look at... Uh, the peak voltage is 160... 
163.9 and a half. Let's just say, well, yeah, 163.9 and a half. So let's get the calculator. 163.948 divided by, that was the volts. Uh, now the amps, 245.287. Two forty five point two eight seven. So we've got about a two thirds relationship. So the voltage is two thirds of the amperage. And uh, otherwise, turn that around, it's one and a half to one. So the so the amps is one and a is three is it's three to two. So it's the the amp the relationship now is not four to one anymore. Now it's three to two, amps to volts. So we we brought down the ratio, and I bet if we brought it down some more, it would continue to suppress the amps. And before you knew it, the volts would dominate over the amps, but overall the wattage would be diminishing as well. And I guess that's what you want when you want to throttle. You want to bring down your overall power, but you also want to bring down your amperage to voltage ratio. Um, to reflect the fact that just because you're running an AC motor, an AC system, doesn't mean the DC is not there. Remember, every half cycle it's DC. It's the change between each half cycle of an AC cycle that is, makes it AC. The, you know, the current reverses direction, but, well, the voltage reverses direction as well. <laughs> Everything reverses direction. But during the duration of each half cycle it's dc that's the <laughs> that's why it's called alternating current because it alternates but the alternation only happens between each half cycle not during the half cycle so it's something to keep in mind here you know you get the ramification of ac only in the change between each two halves of the cycle otherwise strictly speaking during each half cycle it's dc in how it behaves. Now it may be reacting still <laughs> during the course of that half cycle to the change that happened at the beginning of each half cycle, but that's a different matter. The, the point is the current is behaving as DC during the half cycle. And so you have to look at it both ways when you do an analysis. You have to look at it both as an AC point of reference as well as a DC analysis in order to get the full benefit of what you're trying to study. Um, it's good to point that out. <laughs> um, now I think I've covered everything. So I got a throttle now, which I didn't have before. Um, a truth th throttle. And this was simply a regulator to deal with all of these other components. So this is not a true throttle. It's not something you can dynamically change. It's set. Uh, so it's not the throttle anymore. Um, I thought it might be. Because it did change things. But in a complicated way you have to change other things as a consequence to changing this thing and so and this really is the power section of the circuit um, and this is the, what we want the speed so this will provide the torque and this will blend this the torque with speed as it converts the torque into speed it will blend them um, all in this armature here the motor armature okay so now I gotta change this to throttle so let's do that Let's copy this and then change it to R1. So now that's R1. And this becomes the throttle. And uh, something along the lines of tens or of milliamps, or excuse me, tens of milliohms of resistance modification to this um, dynamic throttling action of this resistor here. Something along those lines. I don't know. Let's just, uh, ballpark figure, let's just say tens. Um, now I call this rotor 2 for a reason because this is the secondary of the bifiler pair. This is the primary. This receives the energy from here and then it gets transferred to number 2, rotor number 2, and then in turn then gets transferred to the motor armature <coughs> of uh, I guess this would be the rotor coil here. You know, these three coils, 
would be the rotor coils. And then this coil here is the stator coil of 10 Henry's. So I should say that. I should put names here for these two coils so that we understand what they are. Um, so this is really in combination. It should be rotor 3. This 200 nano Henry should be rotor number 3. And then this coil down here should be the stator coil is what it should be. And this is the motor armature. So now that we got that all straightened out, <laughs> um, one other thing before I go. The A Arthur Matthews version of the Tesla Pierce Arrow uh, story puts the Pierce Arrow demonstration not in 1930s, but in 1897. And Peter Saville probably wasn't even born yet because uh, he was young. He was a young assistant, and he was not the nephew to Nikola Tesla. But he was also a thief, and Tesla knew it. So that's why I think what happened was Tesla told him a fairy tale story of what he did. And maybe, you know, I had an uncle who uh, would tell me stories, and he would put it in the name of my birth name and say, you know, David and the White Pegasus, um, the White Horse Pegasus, uh, with wings. And, oh, is it the same David as me? Uh, no, there's a different David. <laughs> so, I, you know, and this is what I think the Book of Esther is, because a rabbi told us that all rabbis agree the Book of Esther is a work of fiction. It never happened. Um, but I, su I suspect the author of that fiction put himself in the story, namely uh, the father of Esther, I forget his, Mordecai. Mordecai was an actual person because I, I, my inner knowing is that I met the reincarnation of Mordecai. He was a neighbor, he, uh, she, <laughs> in this incarnate life, uh, one of my neighbors when I used, used to live in Studio City uh, in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles. Um, so I suspect, you know, it was like the, you know, the Alice in Wonderland story. The guy who wrote it, uh, Lewis Carroll, he would tell these fantasies to little Alice, a real live person by the name of Alice, and put her in the story and kept himself out. Well, in the case of Mordecai, um, he put himself in the story, and it might have been a bedtime story that he told his daughter Esther, you know, and put her in the story as well. Uh, put both of them in the story and so that they could, she could uh, enjoy the fantasy, that they were both in this fantasy together. Um, but I think something like that might have happened because Peter Savo then went and spread it around as if it actually happened. And, of course, we know it, it couldn't have, especially as a radio reception. No way. No way. It, it's a, f a work of fiction uh, of probably Nikola Tesla making up a fictional story, telling it to Peter Savo, and Peter Savo just ran with it and told it to us because he doesn't know any better. He doesn't know any differently. But he's not a credible witness because he's not a nephew. And he's not a credible witness because he wasn't there when it happened. According to Arthur Matthews, who was an assistant, uh, it happened more than 30 years prior to the Peter Savo version of the story. And it had nothing to do... Um, it, it had a, it was an eighteen thousand RPM. <clears throat> Am I right? Oh my God, eighteen thousand! Holy moly! This is twenty kilohertz per second. That was no, no, no. Yeah. Oh my God, the story was eighteen thousand RPM. Oh, I gotta verify that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I gotta verify this. This is this sounds ludicrous. But the story went on to say that he used hydraulic transmission to tone it down so that his wheels could turn. So you see, I didn't make that up. I actually got that idea from the Arthur Matthews story. I just forgot that I got it from that story. Uh, where are we here? Here we go. No. Here. Uh, here. No. <laughs> I don't have a recent... Okay, I don't have a recent... Okay, so let's go get this recent version here. I hope it works. So, I did some changes to my website, uh, Tesla Pierce Arrow 1931.info. Uh, is that the name of the website? Yeah, I think so. Wait a minute. 
Tesla Pierce Zero, 1931.info, right. I made some changes. Uh, I took out a lot of the simulations, not all of them. Um, so I tell you about, read the ebook, and then I talk about the Arthur Matthews story. And this is the quote that I got from newenergy.org, is it? Yeah, New Energy, N-U, the letters N is in Nancy, U is in Underwood, nuenergy.org. And, um, and let's see, where does it say the RPM? 1897. Oh, let's, maybe we can increase this. I can't see worth a dime here without my glasses. Ah, there we go. So, 1897, he drove from New York City to Buffalo at 94 miles an hour. Uh, and he had a zinc battery, a primary battery. He would swap out the plates, the zinc plates, 500 miles before the plates would have to be changed. Where's the frequency? 30,000 RPM, excuse me. So it was 30,000 RPM. So we get our handy-dandy calculator. 30,000 divided by 60. Oh, it's a mere 500 hertz. Oh, that's not bad. Oh, so it's nowhere near mine. <laughs> I don't know where I got 18,000 from. Well, 18 was half a 30. And yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, so this is the story that is probably more fa fact than fiction. And I... Um, I have to say, you know, this that's the way things are, you know. <laughs> uh, okay, no, I, oh, I was playing around with an oscillating earth battery. That's one of Paul Falstead's, uh, oh yeah, I had a picture here, but apparently the picture doesn't come up because I'm not connected to the internet. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, where do I get this back to regular size? Oh, I don't see it. Um, okay, so I think I covered everything. Um, so I guess now you know the latest and the greatest of what I've been working on. And I have to make some now further changes to my ebook. Um, I made some yesterday, uh, which was July 17th. But now the 18th of July, 2019, I got to make some further changes to uh, what I described in this video. I got to add it to the text and change the schematic. And by the way, you can download the schematic. Um, f I don't have a shortcut URL. I should make a shortcut URL. You can download the compositional uh, image, uh, Heaviside Ferranti. Um, I, I'm going to have to add something. So let's say, let's make the schematic Heaviside Ferranti um, schematic. Yeah, three words. Hardly a shortcut, but at least it's easy to remember. Heaviside Ferranti schematic, and that'll be the microcap simulation file. Um, is that the way I want to do it? Well, yeah, duh. <laughs> this is a composition. I don't call this a schematic. Um, yeah, whatever, <laughs> yeah, schematic, sounds good. Okay, until we meet again, happy trails <laughs> to you, until we meet again, happy trails. I'm a Roy Rogers fan, I love that program. Roy Rogers and Dale Evans, uh, they were such nice people. <laughs>